Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper, beginning with a news item on page number one of the Delhi edition of The Hindu, relevant for GS Paper 2. Before the electronic voting machines were put to use for the Indian elections, we were using ballot papers and ballot boxes. Let's assume this is a ballot paper. On this ballot paper, the presiding officer would put his seal and the signature. This is the ballot paper listing down the candidates contesting the election from your constituency as well as the symbol of the party. And when this ballot paper was presented to me because I'm the voter, I had the option of marking my preference. So my vote is registered against this candidate. And then this ballot paper I used to put down in the ballot box. But there was one beautiful thing with these ballot boxes and ballot papers. The entire process was transparent. Because when I'm registering my vote against the candidate or the party of my choice, and then I am dropping this ballot paper into the ballot box, I know for sure for which political party or for which candidate my vote has been registered. Then we shifted to an electronic voting machine. And in this electronic voting machine, all I have to do, press the blue button against the candidate of my choice. But there is one problem with an electronic voting machine. This process lacks transparency. Because when I'm pressing the button, I do not know whether my vote has been registered against the party of my choice or not. Whether my vote has been indeed registered for the candidate of my choice or not, because the entire process lacks transparency. Then what Election Commission of India came about? They devised a tool called VVPAT, Voter Verifiable Paper Audit Trail. This is just like a printer which is connected with the electronic voting machine. So when I'm pressing the button on the electronic voting machine, then the screen will display three things. And this is very important for your prelims examination. Tomorrow in your prelims examination, you may be asked, which are these three things that are displayed on the VVPAT machines when you press the button on the electronic voting machine? Number one, the serial number of the vote. Number two, the name of the candidate. And number three, the symbol of the political party. These are the three things that will be displayed on the VVPAT screen and that too for seven seconds. After seven seconds are over, this slip will be cut and it will drop into the VVPAT box. But at the time of the counting, what is counted? Only the EVMs or these VVPAT slips as well? Till date, we have a procedure that Election Commission, it counts the EVMs and one VVPAT machine or one VVPAT box per constituency. That means in the entire parliamentary or an assembly constituency, one VVPAT will be taken up. We will count these slips one by one and match these VVPAT slips with the electronic voting machine votes to check whether EVMs are foolproof or not. We have realized that EVMs and VVPATs together, they are more than 99.9% .9 accurate. That means the number of votes counted from these VVPAT boxes, they match the votes on the electronic voting machines. But then the opposition political parties, they approached the Supreme Court and asked the Supreme Court, please direct the Election Commission of India that you should change your policy. Instead of counting only one VVPAT per constituency, you should count 50% of the VVPATs per constituency. Election Commission of India said, if we are going to physically count all these VVPAT slips, it will delay the announcement of the results by at least six to seven days. But now what the Supreme Court has done, Supreme Court has ruled that five VVPAT machines will be counted per constituency. That is something that you need to understand from this newspaper article. But let me tell you something else as well. Former Chief Election Commissioner S.Y. Qureshi has proposed an alternative method. S.Y. Qureshi says that if in a particular constituency there is a winner and then there are two runner-ups, runner-up one, runner-up two. These two runner-ups should be given an option 
that you can choose any two VVPath machines for verification to check whether the votes because of these VVPath slips, whether they are matching with the electronic voting machines or not. So in total, in a particular constituency, election commission will have to count or verify only four VVPaths. So this is an innovative alternative to the Supreme Court judgment. But as of now, what do we need to understand from this newspaper article? That per constituency, five VVPaths will be physically verified because the opposition were asking for 50% VVPath verification. And there are three things that are displayed on VVPath machines. Number one, the serial number. Number two, the name of the candidate and the symbol of the political party to which the candidate belongs. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Now let's look at another news on page number one. It's advantage NDA, but it may fall short of majority. Over the past few days, many opinion polls have been released, published and broadcast. Almost all these opinion polls are unanimous that BJP will be in a position to form the government. But whether BJP will get the majority on its own, whether the party will get 272 plus to form the government on its own or will it require allies or will it be a coalition government in 2019? But that is not our matter of concern. But what is of the matter of concern are these opinion polls. Should opinion polls be banned? Because they have a potential of influencing the minds of the voters. For example, do these opinion polls influence the choices that voters make when they go out to vote in the Indian elections? Let's have an elaborate discussion on this matter. Number one, opinion polls cannot be banned. Why? Opinion polls, they derive their strength from Article 19, Clause 1, Clause A of the Constitution, which is a fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression. That means what is an opinion poll? Elections are a public affair. And in a public affair, people should know how others are voting or how others are making up their choice. So if this is part of freedom of speech and expression, that means opinion polls cannot be banned. That doesn't mean that freedom of speech and expression is absolute. There are restrictions on your freedom of speech and expression imposed by the Constitution under Article 19, Clause 2. But these restrictions are on the grounds of sovereignty of the nation, security of the state, friendly relations with foreign countries, contempt of court. And there are eight provisions mentioned under Article 19, Clause 2 on the basis of which your freedom of speech and expression can be restricted. But none of these restrictions apply to opinion polls because opinion polls do not hamper the friendly relations between India and the friendly countries. Opinion polls are not contempt of court. Opinion polls are not against the sovereignty of this country. Opinion polls are not against the security of the state. Opinion polls are not against the morality or the decency of the society. So none of the restrictions that are mentioned under Article 19, Clause 2 that apply to freedom of speech and expression, none of these restrictions apply to opinion polls. That means opinion polls cannot be banned. But do these opinion polls influence the minds of the voters? For that, we need to understand that there are broadly two types of voters in India. One, committed voters. And number two, fence sitters. Who are these committed voters? For example, if I am believer of the ideology of the Bharatiya Janata Party, I believe in nationalism or hyper-nationalism. I believe in Hindutva. No matter what the opinion polls are saying, I will still vote for the BJP. Or if I belong to a communist ideology, no matter what the opinion polls are saying, I will still vote for the left parties. That means there is a group of voters who are committed to the ideology of a particular political party. And no matter what the opinion polls are saying or suggesting, I will not change my mind because I am committed to the ideology of a political party. These opinion polls do not influence these committed voters. But then there are fence-sitters. And that is what we call bandwagon effect of these opinion polls. What is this bandwagon effect? Nobody wants to be on the losing side. Nobody wants to waste her or his vote. If I am a fence sitter, that means 
I do not belong to any ideological party. I do not have any ideological preferences. But once these opinion poll results are released, I see party A is leading these opinion polls. And since I don't want to be on the losing side, I don't want to be on the side of the loser, I don't want to waste my vote, I will vote for party A because party A is all set to form the government if opinion poll results are to be taken at their face value. So these opinion polls, they have the tendency to influence these fence setters and that is what we call the bandwagon effect. And it is for this reason that there are various political parties, there are various activists who are saying that opinion polls should be banned in this country or regulated in this country. But we have discussed that opinion polls cannot be banned. But there is one way in which we can limit the influence of these opinion polls on the fence setters. And what is that restriction? Voter silence or what we call the period of silence. What is this period of silence? Can be a potential question for your prelims examination. Let's say for example, there is a voting on, let's say 11th of April, for example, and the voting will end 6 p.m. on 11th of April. 48 hours prior to the end of the voting, it's a period of election silence. That means, number one, political parties cannot campaign during this period because it's a period of election silence. And also, opinion poll results or findings cannot be published, cannot be broadcast. This is a sufficient, reasonable restriction on the misuse of these opinion polls. But then there is something else called an exit poll. What is the difference between the exit poll and the opinion poll? Opinion poll is, people are asked, whom are you going to vote for? But whom are you going to vote for? This answer may change at the time of voting as well. Seven days before the voting, I was asked, whom are you going to vote for? I may say, I am going to vote for party A. But something happens in these seven days, then I switch my loyalty or I change my mindset and I am now voting for party B. So opinion polls are not always on mark. Opinion polls are not always correct representation of what may lie in store at the time of the election results. But what is this exit poll? Exit poll is after I have cast my vote outside the polling booth, there are people waiting for me. They're asking me, whom have you voted for? There is a ban on the publication of exit poll findings till the last phase is over, till the last person has cast her or his vote. That means in India, we have a provision through which we can restrict the influence on the minds of the voters. And that is number one, opinion polls findings cannot be published during this period of election silence, which is 48 hours before the voting. And number two, exit polls, which are considered to be slightly more accurate than the opinion polls, exit poll findings cannot be published or broadcast unless and until the last person has cast her vote. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Now let's look at another news on page number seven, Army gets Danush artillery guns. What is Danush artillery gun? It is indigenously upgraded version of Beaufort's guns, which were procured in the 1980s. And Beaufort's guns were procured from the Swedish manufacturer. And Danish is the indigenously upgraded version of this Beaufort's gun. One more important detail that this gun is fitted with global positioning system. Very important statement for your prelims examination. And number two, it is not fully indigenous. That means all the things that are required to manufacture Danush artillery gun, they are not procured from India alone. This Danush artillery gun is as of now 81% indigenous. And over a period of time, by the end of 2019, it will be 91% indigenous. And the range of the Danush gun is 36 km. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Now let's look at another news on page number 7, IIT Madras top centers higher education rankings. What are we talking about? We are talking about national institution ranking framework. 
what is this framework this framework was approved by ministry of human resources development mhrd and the year was 2015 this framework outlines methodology and through this methodology we are ranking institutions across the country and according to this national institutional ranking framework for 2019 iit madras is at serial number 1 followed by indian institute of science bengaluru and iit delhi what can be the possible prelims based question asked from this newspaper article that i am going to tell you towards the end of this lecture now let's have a discussion on namo tv and look at what type of question can be asked in your prelims examination from this controversy a new channel namo tv has emerged across the major direct to home platforms that too in the last fortnight in the last 15 days political parties have approached the election commission of india that namo tv violates the model code of conduct aam aadmi party for example is asking the election commission of india how was the permission granted to namo tv that too when election commission's model code of conduct is in operation Congress party on the other hand is asking the election commission of india how did information and broadcasting ministry allow nama tv to be broadcast now let's look at what this issue is all about this channel is listed among the hindi news channels on some direct to home platforms but when the list released by information and broadcasting ministry the list of those channels which are permitted by the ministry when this list was released it did not mention namo tv then the question was raised how is this news channel or how is this namo tv being broadcasted right now because it is not mentioned in the list of the channels which are approved by the information and broadcasting ministry because all satellite based channels they require the ministry's permission to be downlinked in the country irrespective of the content the information and broadcasting ministry has apparently told the election commission of india that namo tv does not require the permission of information and broadcasting ministry why because namo tv is a platform service and a platform service does not require the permission of the information and broadcasting ministry but what is this platform service can be a potential question for your prelims examination there are four types of channels on tv number 1 there is a private satellite channels these channels are broadcast through satellites and these channels require inb ministry's permission for example star colors all these private satellite channels which are broadcast through satellites they require information and broadcasting ministry's permission then we have doordarshan channels which are run by prasar bharti board then there are local channels for example local gujarati bihari bhojpuri tamil channels and number 4 there are platform channels or platform services these platform services they are distributed exclusively to their own subscribers and who can distribute them cable network operators cable tv operators or direct to home operators for example tata sky has some platform services for example tata sky active for example the channel 100 of tata sky for example their showcase channels or on demand movie channels these are what platform services or platform channels are all about but these platform services can be given to only those who are your subscribers that too by a cable operator or by your dth operator but how is it that there is this namo tv which inb ministry says is a platform service how is this platform service broadcasted on all the tvs in this country regardless of the dth operator regardless of your cable operator that is what the controversy is all about two more things relevant for your prelims examination regarding namo tv number 1 as i said these platform services they do not require the permission from the information and broadcasting ministry that means they cannot be punished by information and broadcasting ministry however there are two laws which are still applicable to these platform services number 1 the restrictions on free speech mentioned under article 19 clause 2 and number 2 they have to comply with 
advertisement and program codes of the Cable TV Act 1994. So there can be a potential question in your prelims examination that there are no laws which apply to platform services but this is absolutely wrong because restrictions under article 19 clause 2 apply to these platform services as well and advertisement and program codes of the cable tv act of 1994 do apply to platform services that is what you need to understand from this newspaper article now let's look at another issue on page number nine party symbol every political party in india has a symbol and because of this symbol the voters can easily identify the political party for example lotus is the symbol of the bjp hand is the symbol of the congress but there is one important statement that you need to understand which can be relevant for your prelims examination for example elephant is the symbol of the bahujan samajwadi party but since 1991 the election commission has stopped allowing parties to use animals as symbols after the complaints from animal rights activists because if for example tomorrow i launch a political party then i have to have one symbol for my political party this is something that i cannot decide on my own i have to give a list of my preferences or election symbols preferences to election commission of india an election commission of India will then pick one of your preferences and will allot this symbol to my political party. But animal symbols will not be allowed now because since 1991, election commission of India has stopped allowing parties to use animals as symbols. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Now, there are two or three important articles in today's newspaper about Maldives. The president of Maldives, Mohammed Ibrahim Saleh, his political party has swept the elections in Maldives. And it is a good sign and good signal for India-Maldives relationship. But this India-Maldives relationship we have covered in detail in our September 24, 2018, the Hindu newspaper analysis. So if you need to know about the India-Maldives relationship, please go through this newspaper analysis. The first thing that we have discussed in that analysis is India-Maldives relationship. Now let's look at some of the editorials and columns from today's newspaper. First up, open up the Supreme Court written by Gautam Bhatia. Few days ago, we discussed a newspaper article where a constitution bench of the Supreme Court is all set to give its verdict. On what matter? This is a collegium consisting of Chief Justice of India and four senior most judges of the Supreme Court. They recommend names to the President about who should be appointed as the judge of the Supreme Court and the High Courts in this country and how the judges from one High Court to another High Court can be transferred. The Supreme Court will have to rule and decide whether the communication between the Collegium and the President, whether this communication can be sought under Right to Information Act of 2005. And Gautam Bhatia argues that yes, RTI should apply to the Supreme Court as well. RTI should apply to the communication between the Collegium and the President of India. Because all power and judicial power is no exception. All power is held accountable in a modern constitution. If RTI is not applicable in this situation, then the basic idea of open justice would get violated. All powerful organs of the state, whether it is the executive or the legislature or even the judiciary, all these organs should be open to public scrutiny. There are people who say that RTI should not apply to judiciary because the privacy of the judges will be violated. But Gautam Bhartia argues that that is not the case. Because in RTI, personal questions cannot be asked. It is only those applications can be entertained by a public authority which involves public interest. For example, if I am asking questions from the judiciary about whether a particular judge is in a living relationship or not, such questions will not be entertained under Right to Information Act. 
if I'm going to seek medical details or information about the marital status of a particular judge, such information cannot be sought under right to information because I'm asking personal questions. It is only when public interest is involved, only such type of information can be sought under right to information. And that is why Gautam Bhatia argues that even judiciary should come under right to information act. Collegium system of judicial appointments original constitution said that the judges of the supreme court and high court shall be appointed by the president but chief justice of india should be consulted but it was never mentioned in the original constitution that the recommendation of the cji will be binding on the president it was only 1993 onwards that this collegium system got developed in this country and india is perhaps the only country in the world where judges are appointed by themselves Collegium recommends names to the president and president has no other option but to appoint this individual as the judge of the Supreme Court or the High Court. President can only say once that please reconsider this name. But if the same name is recommended again by the collegium, president has no other option but to appoint that individual. This makes India the only country in the world where judges are appointed by themselves. But the entire process is opaque entire process lacks transparency because the nomination process is secret we don't know how the judges are nominated by this collegium how collegium decides about a particular name even that is secret why a certain judge can be elevated to the supreme court or why a certain judge cannot be elevated to the supreme court all these reasons are secret all these reasons are hidden we never come to know about them and in fact the problem is something which has been admitted by Justice Markande Kardju. Justice Markande Kardju, the former judge of the Supreme Court of India, when he was the Chief Justice of Allahabad High Court, he admitted that I refused to recommend the name of one lawyer to be appointed as a judge. Do you know why? Because this lawyer was in a living relationship without getting married. But how does that matter? One wonders what is the connection between whether a lawyer is married or not and his ability to discharge judicial functions. Then in 2015, the Parliament of India decided to replace this collegium system with NJAC, National Judicial Appointments Commission, consisting of Chief Justice of India, two senior most judges of the Supreme Court, law minister of this country and two eminent persons. And NJAC was provided with the role of the collegium that means NJAC would recommend to the president the names of those who are to be appointed as the judges of the Supreme Court and the high courts in this country. But what Supreme Court did? In 2015 in a landmark verdict the Supreme Court said that NJAC is unconstitutional because NJAC violates the independence of judiciary. And since independence of judiciary is part of the basic structure of Indian constitution, NJAC is unconstitutional. Supreme Court curiously also said that NJAC violates one more basic structure and that is the primacy of Chief Justice of India in judicial appointments. Since NJAC does not give the primary role to the Chief Justice of India in judicial appointments, that is why NJAC is unconstitutional. But even when declaring NJAC to be unconstitutional, the Supreme Court accepted that yes, there are flaws with our collegium system, we have to be more transparent. But even then, no step has been taken to ensure transparency in the entire process. Except when Justice Deepak Misra was the Chief Justice of India, he decided to introduce one grain of transparency in this process. And that was that the Supreme Court website will mention the names of the candidates who are elevated to the Supreme Court or the High Courts. But why these individuals were elevated, the reasons would not be known. Why others were not recommended for elevation, these reasons also would not be known. So the best thing would be open up the Supreme Court. Gautam Bhatia makes one compelling argument. He writes a judiciary that is confident of itself and its place in the democratic republic should not be worried about subjecting judicial appointments to public scrutiny. We can learn about the transparency from countries such as Kenya, where when candidates are interviewed for the post of judge, 
all these interviews are broadcasted live that means the public is in a position to judge for itself about the selection process and this is very very crucial to maintain public faith in the impartiality of the judiciary as an independent institution that is what you need to understand from this newspaper article now there is another column playing politics over the golan heights now this is something that my colleague has discussed few days ago but let me tell you briefly what is required from this newspaper column from the prelims perspective primarily golan heights was the part of syria and then in 1967 israel launched a war and annexed golan heights from syria but no country had recognized golan heights as a part of israeli territory but now united states is all set to give recognition to israeli sovereignty over this golan heights that's number 1 this article says that us's recognition of israeli sovereignty over the golan heights is a challenge to the rules based international order two more things number 1 in 1970s there was a war famously known as yom kippur war the year was 1973 and this was a war by a coalition of arab states led by egypt and syria and this was a six day war which israel won that's another thing that can be asked in your prelims examination about yom kippur war of 1973 there can be another question on camp david accords these accords resulted in egypt israel peace treaty which is the first ever between an israel and an arab state so these can be possible potential questions that can be asked in your prelims examination from this topic now let's look at another news column on page number 9 crorepatis in parliament according to adr association for democratic reforms which is a non governmental organization working in the field of electoral reforms in this country according to adr 83% of our parliamentarians they are crorepatis which means a rich people's club is governing a largely poor country this column says that there was a time prior to the economic liberalization of the year 1991 that businessmen they stuck to business and politicians would play politics politicians would seek donations from these businessmen politicians would seek job opportunities for their kith and kin from these businessmen but then post 1991 post the period of liberalization privatization globalization these politicians hit upon an idea that we can set up business we can expand business as well if we will be in politics and that is how business and politics got mixed and it got mixed to such an extent that today we see no distinction between the businessman and a politician and all these developments give justification to walter anberg an american businessman and diplomat who said the greatest power is not the money power but political power that is what you need to understand from this newspaper column now let's look at some of the prelims based questions NIRF rankings is based on which of the following parameters teaching learning and resources yes research and professional practices graduation outcomes outreach and inclusivity perception yes all of the above so national institutional ranking framework which i told you in the beginning was approved by ministry of human resources development in the year 2015 and this framework outlines the methodology to rank institutions in this country but on what parameters these are the parameters that are mentioned so this can be a potential question for your prelims examination you should remember all these five parameters on the basis of which nrf rankings are based on arrange the following from south to north let's look at the explanation first is mauritius then agalega islands Diego Garcia and then Maldives. So three one two four B is the right answer. Let's look at another map-based question. Which of the following countries are not part of Indian Community? Indian Community is basically 
a trade agreement area in South America involving some of the South American countries. But Brazil is not part of it. Argentina is not part of it. Colombia and Peru are part of it. But the question says are not part of the Indian community. So one and two, B is the right answer. So who are part of this Indian community? Colombia, Ecuador, Peru and Bolivia. Now let's look at a previous year's prelims based question 2018. Why is a plant called Prosopis juliflora often mentioned in the news? It tends to reduce the biodiversity in the area in which it grows. That is it from our newspaper analysis for today. Thank you for being with us. Have a great day.